Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here. And what I'm going to talk about is, in fact, uh, uh, some of the ideas that will come together in uh, the last volume of a five-volume collection that is being published by Versal in London, which has been a project called Reinventing Social Emancipation. And four volumes are out, and uh, the fifth volume is uh, coming. And uh, I'll start by, you know, the title may be a bit strange to uh, some of you, why and how to take a distance vis-a-vis -vis the Western critical tradition. I think a sense of exhaustion haunts the, the critical tradition. In fact, haunts the global north in general and the Western critical tradition in special. A sense of exhaustion is a sense of stagnation no new ideas. I think also that uh, the world has uh, become less and less Eurocentric in a sense. The global north is smaller and smaller, both in economic, political, and cultural terms. And yet, we cannot make sense of the world other than through general ideas and universal concepts. But these universal ideas, these universal concepts and general theories, seen from the outside, from the global side, we'll see later on what I meant by that, they are less and less convincing. In a sense, for many people, if you position yourself in vast areas of the world, in Africa, in Latin America, and Asia, sometimes you get the sense, talking with colleagues, that the West has very little to teach. The lessons are out, and uh, there is little else that the West can teach. And yet, I think that if we don't have much to teach, we seem to have lost the capacity to learn from the outside experience, from the experiences of the world. I think colonialism has disabled us to understand and to know more about this experience. And therefore, this is probably why, in critical theory, we have been so strong about criticizing capitalism and so weak about criticizing colonialism. In a sense, we are part of the problem and not part of the solution. How does it, this sense of exhaustion expresses itself in many ways? The first one is the lack of alternatives. It looks like we don't have any longer any alter credible alternatives to the current state of affairs, which is ugly enough. In a sense, social regulation, you know, all of us have conceived of a modernity as this uh, combining tension between social regulation and social emancipation, and all of a sudden there is no social regulation, and out of this collapse of social regulation, there is no social emancipation arising from that. So there is no impulse for social emancipation, and I'll try to explain uh, why this is so. It is so much so that in the last 30 years, I think the legitimacy basis for governments, for democratic governments, particularly in the global north, has ceased to be consensus and has become resignation. They don't uh, really focus on the consensus of citizens. They focus on the resignation of citizens. And what we see today with the Occupy movement, with the Indignados movement, is a reaction against the suffocation of the absence of real alternatives. So it looks like we have modern problems for which there are no modern solutions. We still have the problem of freedom, the problem, the problem of equality, the problem of fraternity. But all of a sudden, all the modern solutions, from revolution to socialism to social democracy, seem exhausted. They seem not to be there. And therefore, there is a sense here that there is something wrong with the way we theorize probably the world. And that's my starting point for this first lecture. In a sense, we sometimes resent the fact that in the global south, there is much more innovation. Lots of innovation, transformations, progressive alternatives are arising that we don't see in the global north anymore. Look, for instance, when you compare the disobedience to the IMF rule 
throughout the world, the global south, for us that have studied this in the 90s, in Brazil, in Mexico, Indonesia, and so on, in Argentina, all of a sudden what's happening in Europe? Prey of the same recipes. No alternative at this point. No idea that these recipes, which in fact, all of a sudden, are not just for the third world, or for the peripheral of the law system, but they are applied at the core of the system. It does seem to be an innovative response to this question. Moreover, I think that we are pulled apart at this point. It is, it is very difficult to theorize at this point because we are pulled apart by two contradictory time frames for our collective action. And I see very well, and you see that in our classes, very clearly with the students. We see on one side the sense of urgency, the idea that we have to act now. If we don't act now, tomorrow will be too late. Climate change is a good example of this sense of urgency that we cannot wait. There is no probably, we should not wait for the long term because probably there is no long term, right? On the other side, we, we are pulled apart by another temporality which tells us that the, the seriousness of the problems that we are confronting, most of them are inside ourselves, call for a civilizatory change, for a civilizational change. And the civilizatory change cannot take place until 2015. That's when the United Nations says that the climate change will be reversible. We cannot change this. So I think that we have, as since this sense of exhaustion is reflecting itself within critical theory, Western critical theory and in Marxism itself, as a sense of stagnation. And this sense of stagnation is that we are ever more competent in our empirical work. But our empirical work barely hides the poverty of our theories. The idea that we are not renewing theory as we should be doing. Moreover, we are incapable of radical theories. The impossibility of radicalism seems to be is one of the conditions of our age. Some people, some scholars that pretend to be more and more radical than the others end up as entertainers in the media circus. I don't want to be unjust with my friend Slavoj Gizek. Sometimes it happens like that. Kemper, let's go back to 1677 and see what happened and in February of 1677. There was a huge debate, really a commotion in Europe, in learned Europe, in the elites, the political elites, about the truthfulness of a radical idea. And the idea that everything would depend on whether that radical idea would sustain itself or would be demolished forever. And why was this commotion going on? Because Spinoza, great philosopher, was in this deathbed. And the idea was that Spinoza, as a very intelligent person, would at the end of his life recognize that he had committed all kinds of sacrilegious mistake. Because according to the Protestant governments of the time, Spinoza had denied the existence of God. Of course, we know that it was not true. Uh, God, uh, Spinoza had a very beautiful concept of God, Deus sive natura, that is to God, that is nature. But for them, uh, this was not. It was a denial of God. And therefore, the idea was that this guy at the end of his life, at the moment of truth, when he was about to live, life, then you come to the truth. Because no intelligent man at that time, that's what they think, men and women, of course, would not but would not fail to recognize the existence of Almighty God. Can you imagine that they posted spies outside his very humble house? He lived with a carpenter. He died at 40 years of age. And they put spies around the house. For what purpose? or they should report it to the authorities whether at the end of that, those very moments of the, his life, you would call the confessor, the priest. You would in the end recognize and confess his sins and return to the, to the church. So can you imagine the powerful idea of this guy? And better he published a book. He had no army, no party, no social movement. But in the end, everything depended on those radical ideas. We had many people after that. I mean, in 1849, Marx arrived from exile in London, 
and we are celebrating this year the 50th anniversary of the rest of the world, the, uh, the earth. Franz Fanon, probably great, 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 the last great radical of our time. But we really think that there is the crisis here of radical idea. And therefore, we, this, I, this crisis of radical ideas become even more troubling for us because we see that outside of the global north, there are lots of, uh, Eric was mentioning the, in the ninth of the work that we were starting doing on participatory budgeting, then we did in India. There were many other things going on in South Africa. There were things going on in Latin America and today in Ecuador, Bolivia, etc., and uh, Venezuela. So we think that uh, we look at those experiences in our departments and we write the dissertations about them. But what we do very often is we convert those realities into raw material for our theories. We, we fail to recognize, since we are so focused on the idea of a monoculture of valid knowledge, which, which is scientific knowledge, that we are not aware of the fact that those experiences have embedded and embodied knowledges. They are living knowledges, born in struggle. While we at our universities, in a very Galian sense, knowledge comes to us after the struggle, of course. And that's why we have vanguard theories. The vanguard theories is the false consciousness of this same syndrome. So it is very difficult for us to understand this and to see how this reality can be encompassed in our work. Moreover, even if we focus on capitalism, which has been our specialty, it is very hard for us confronting a situation that can be formulated in this way. It is as difficult to imagine the end of capitalism as it is difficult to imagine that capitalism will have no end. We can't see really the end of the capitalism, but as an historical fact, it has to end one day. But we, between these two difficulties, we are really blocked. How does this uh, sense of exhaustion reflect itself in theory? In two ways, in recent times, very, very, which for me, in my work, and of course I'm, uh, there's a lot, as you can imagine, of self-criticism in this stuff, as was, I think, that it's clear for all of you. The first one, there are two uh, symptoms which I think are very important for us to, to analyze this sense of stagnation. The first one is what I call the loss of critical nouns. There was a time in which the North Centric critical theory, Marxism and the other currents of critical theory, owned, in a sense, a vast set of nouns. One would start a book and one would see the nouns of the critical theory, which were very different from the nouns from any other theory. Communism, socialism, dependency, class struggle, alienation, fetishism of commodities, exploitation. They were the nouns, in a sense, that were owned by the critical theory. The nouns are still there, but they don't command the centrality and the strength that they once had. On the contrary, in the last 30 years, critical theory lost the nouns and specialized in adjectives. It borrows the nouns from conventional theory, and then tries to subvert the meaning of the nouns by resorting to adjectives. And of course the adjectives may subvert the, the, the meaning of nouns. Voltaire used to say that the adjectives are the enemies of the nouns. Well, for instance, if conventional bourgeois theory speaks of development, we speak of alternative development, of sustainable development, of integ integral development, or democratically sustainable development. If conventional theory speaks of democracy, we speak of radical democracy, deliberative democracy, participatory democracy. If conventional theory speaks of human rights, we speak, as I do, of collective human rights, intercultural human rights, indigenous human rights. If conventional theory speaks about cosmopolitanism, our cosmopolitanism is there, but with adjectives, subaltern, insurgent, rooted, 
There are some of the names in our theories. So, this fact should be seriously analyzed because, of course, nouns are not an uh, inalienable property of the conventional theory. In fact, in all my work, for instance, I work a lot with questions of, of sociology of law. Very often, my main idea is the counter-hegemonic use of hegemonic instruments. The popular movements very often today resort to hegemonic instruments like, for instance, the legal system or democracy to conduct their counter-hegemonic struggles. And I have studied them and I have worked with them and so on and so forth. And yet, we should see the limits of this. Because in a sense, the critical theory is now relying on what I call conceptual franchising. We get the nouns from other theories and we try to renew theory by really using our own adjectives in our way. This is all possible and this is very important, but we should be aware of the limits of that. Because we become derivative since we have lost the nouns. And therefore, we can change the terms of the debate, but we cannot change the debate. We speak on different conceptions of democracy, but democracy and something else, we can't at this point. And that's the problem we are facing today. Moreover, social movements throughout the world are really bringing in new concepts. But these new concepts are expressed in languages that are non-colonial languages. And we don't master them. And we don't know them. There were some that were very famous many years ago. In Swaraj, for instance, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of Gandhi's book. In Swaraj became really a rallying concept for many people in the South. But we have more recent concepts. For instance, in the Constitution of Ecuador, Suma Causa, or in Bolivia, Suma Camaña, or Pachamama, or many other concepts. Or we have in many today social movements in Africa the concept of Ubuntu. They are not expressed in colonial languages. And when we translate them into colonial languages, the usual familiar terms that we are expecting don't come out. Doesn't come out socialism doesn't come out democracy, doesn't come out uh, human rights, doesn't come out democ uh, development, comes out what? Dignity, respect, territory, self-government, sacredness of spirituality. So concepts which are very, very unfamiliar to us, to the to Western centric critical theory. For instance, we are absolutely unable to deal with, uh, with the idea of spirituality. Because we tend, because of secularism, we tend to convert anything that smacks spirituality to transcendental type of things. So we don't have a subtle type of knowledge for different concepts of immanence. That's part of our Cartesian inheritance. So therefore, we have a problem here. And the second problem out of this, uh, in my view, this exhaustion, is what I call the ghostly relationship between theory and practice. There is a, a huge discrepancy between what it was foreseen and is foreseen in theory and the innovative transformative practices that are taking place around the world. I think that in the 30 years, most of the, in the last 30 years, the most advanced struggles had protagonists, social groups, whose existence was made invisible, was invisible for the Western centric critical theory. Women, to begin with, of course, indigenous people, peasants, Afro-descendants, piqueteros, unemployed, gays and lesbians, and now the indignados and the occupy. So we have people that will not, they, they don't even organize according to the, the principles of organizations that were basic for us within the Western political theory. The party, the union, the strike, the mass strike, in the case of, of, uh, of Rosa Luxemburg. The institutional action, more direct action. So these two options. Moreover, these people very often don't live in the urban centers that we are used to visiting them. They live in very remote areas, in the Andean region, 
they live uh, in the basins and the plains of the Amazonian, of, the, of India, very remote people, struggling for water, for land, at this point, against the new forms of neocolonialism that we call land grabbing, which is probably the newest form of colonialism underway. So, yet as I say, that their struggles don't speak our language. So, my, the, in, in my work, I'm, I'm going into detail on the consequences of the blindness of theories vis-à-vis -vis the practices and the blindness of practice vis-à-vis -vis the theory. So, because of the blindness of the theory, the practices go untheorized leading to ad hoc, spontaneism, and all kinds of things you can imagine. But the blindness of practice also renders theory irrelevant, basically. And you can see that there's a struggle for relevance at this point in our areas. Why is that? Why is that? Well, I think there are many causes for this ghostly relationship. But I think the main one is that the critical, Western critical theory was developed in five European countries while most of the innovative social practices are taking part, are taking place in the global south. They were created in, in Germany, in Russia, in Italy, in France, in the United Kingdom, a little bit later in the United States, to have an impact on the struggles of the peoples here in Europe and North America. But of course they could not account for the realities of other countries, because they were very foreign. And we can see that now in retrospect how much of this reality was outside our concerns. Because the theories were concerned with the realities here. There was a great, great intellectual, Marx, a lot of them, that now all the manuscripts that are coming out in the new editions, which will be hundreds of volumes of the work by Marx, in which he dealt with ethnicity and with all these other non-Western societies because he was aware of the fact of the limits of his theory, but he could never come out to develop fully all these other realities. So they really accounted for the realities they knew. There is nothing to blame. But then because of our hubris in the West, they became European universalists. They became universalists. One of the most intriguing things is that, for me, I'm a, for a long time I've been studying the Frankfurt School, by far the most remarkable uh, development of critical theory in the, in the West, in my view, particularly the original one. How is it possible that for the, for the critical school, almost no reference is made to colonialism, even though the majority of the population of the world at the time was under colonial rule? They were not relevant. They were not visible. They were not there. So I think that precisely because of that, we have this condition. And at this point, probably, we still, if we still try to stick in under current circumstances to a kind of a vanguard theory, we look like ridiculous in a sense, on a global scale, I would say. And that's why in my work, I plead for real guard theories, not for vanguard. We have to, from now on, to work very closely with social movements, try to develop whatever is being developed by them, amplifying the experiences, comparing things, create, facilitating, creating complexity, helping on simplicity according to the different circumstances. But you have to walk with the movements. You know, Commandant Marcos once said, you have to, in any social movement, you, were, you go together with those that go more slowly, not with those that go fast. And I think that's what I call real guard theories. Well, these causes uh, that I just mentioned of this, uh, the idea that it is becoming more and more clear for all of us that this uh, Western general theories and universalism are really particularisms. It is not the result of an intellectual. It is disquieting, very disquieting for us. But it is not a result of intellectual, the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, intellectual um, lucidity that we have now more than before. No, it's because of the protagonism of those that were forgotten by this history, that were made invisible by bio ways of thinking. And you have in your paper, in your readings, 
one uh, paper of mine in which I developed the concept of abyssal thinking. How our, I myself, in that paper, do kind of a self-critique of my own perceptions because in my anti's work, I always consider that as a standard within Western modernity, distinction between social legal regulation and social emancipation. That is to say the discrepancy between current experiences and possible expectations about the life. That's what is modern society. And the concept of progress is precisely this uh, a discrepancy between current experiences and future expectations, expectations about the future. Because in the previous society, whoever would uh, um, be born in a poor family would probably end in a poor family. Would be born in a illiterate family would probably end in a illiterate uh, family. That changes with modern society. And therefore, we have claimed that this would be the nuclear concept for the modern societies, this discrepancy between social regulation and social emancipation. What is forgotten by that? It's because this applied only to metropolitan societies. Because in colonial societies, the discrepancy was not between regulation and emancipation, it was between appropriation and violence. That was completely different. And that's why this article changed, changed in fact, my theorizing in a sense, to account for this other side, the appropriation, because I can see today that from the very beginning, the colonial zone is the zone in which we are going to say that there is the other side of the line. There is an abyssal line, and in my work, in that work, you see, I distinguish between the visible distinctions and the divisible distinctions. For instance, a visible distinction is the one between social regulation and, the and social emancipation. The invisible distinction is that this applies only to metropolitan societies and not to colonial societies. And I analyze modern law and modern, uh, modern science, and I can see the same abyssal line going on. When we distinguish between what is legal and illegal, the creation of the modern legal system applies only to this side of the line. Does not apply to the other side of the line. Because it leaves out an invisible distinction between law and lawlessness. On the other side of the line was lawlessness. And you can see from the 17th century how the the, the, the governments in the old world would get into agreement with each other, but their agreements would only be valid on this side of the line, that is to say, on the old world. In the new world, they would not apply. The French king, allied to the Spanish king, would ally himself with the pirates that were uh, robbing the Spanish uh, 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 ships because they were occurring on the other side of the line. So it doesn't apply to the same rules didn't apply, of course, to the reality here. And you, if, if we read now under this uh, perspective, Locke and Hobbes, you can see very much the same. What is the state of nature? For both of them, the state of nature is in the America, in the colonial zone. What they don't say is that the state of nature is not what it was there, is what it is being created by colonialism. So if you change the lines, the lenses, for our knowledge, you can see that modern, Western modernity and modern societies is not a movement from the state of nature to a civil society. It's the coexistence of the two. And one grows together with the other. Because at the same time that we are creating civil society, we are subjecting vast bodies of population to the state of nature. Example. All of us are very excited about the, birth, the, the birth of labor law in the 19th century. Labor law was the most progressive form of, of social rights that we had in Europe and then in the United States. Because it was collective bargaining, because it was the recognition of the work as an access to citizenship. What we forget is that at that same time, labor law in the colonies was penal law, was not facilitating law, was not protective law, was penal law was forced labor. We have a distinction on this side of the line, for instance, between the laws of things and laws of persons. On one side, family law, inheritance law. On the other side, contracts, property, sell, buy and selling, things, and so on. Well, on the other side of the line, all law was law of things. 
Some things were human, other things were not human. So we forgot this disparity because in fact our theories have been focusing on this side of the line and left the other side of the line invisible. And of course it is the struggles of the other side of the line that are now more and more showing us how much we have wasted of social experience. Things that we have not seen. Because in fact, this divide, this abyssal uh, line, one could say, well, it ended with colonialism. No, it didn't end with colonialism. In fact, continues today. And I think that's what we could call now uh, the idea of post-colonialism is precisely this. It's the idea that colonialism goes on today under different names and different ways. That is to say, we still continue to create abyssal lines between humanity and subhumanities, between what is a civil society, what is state of nature. In a sense, we are witnessing in our societies the return of the colonial. There are bodies of people to whom we don't apply the civilized, the civilized laws of constitution and of uh, the rule of law. We have the colonial is in our societies today. The abyssal line between us and them goes down. And in my work, I distinguish two very prominent cases of uh, uh, abyssal others in our society. The terrorist and the undocumented migrant worker. All the principles that we have developed in modern law and so on don't apply in general to them. If you look at the, at the most recent migrant uh, migration laws in Europe, you can see that they are not really organized according to the principles of social regulation and social emancipation. They are organized according to the principles of appropriation and violence. In Europe today, it is possible to put a child, two years old child, for 18 months in a deposit before the fathers and the parents are, are reported. This is appropriation and violence. This is not the rule of law that we have always think, thought that would be governing our societies in a kind of regulatory toward a more emancipatory way. So I think that if we look at that, then what, out of this picture, what, what comes out for, for our ways of theorizing? It comes out, I think, in my work at least, I'm sharing this with you, and of course this is for debate. Tomorrow we'll be more specific on some of these ideas. Is that there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. They say, at the core of our problems is a, a question of epistemological justice. It's a question of knowledge. Modern knowledge, modern scientific knowledge has created and produced immense epistemicide. The destruction of knowledge of peoples. Genocide always went together with epistemicide. We have to destroy their knowledges in order to destroy them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, our systems of learning has been also a system of destroying knowledge mm -hmm. on a global scale. So there is an epistemological problem here. A problem of cognitive justice. And this problem should be confronted and should be understood. What are the two premises that came out of that of that idea. That is to say that there is no global justice without global cognitive justice. The first one is the following. The understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. It is very hard for the general theories that we have developed in the West to understand this. But this is the premise out of which we have to start. The second one is that the diversity of the world is infinite. And therefore, no general theory can cope with that, can cover all that. We have to abandon the idea of general theories because they really can't do the job. Because the question now is not so much on a different kind of knowledge, but on different ways of producing knowledge. More collectivized knowledge and not so individualized forms of knowledge. Because in a sense, what I, if we do our work in, uh, 
with the, you know, with this critical lens I'm trying to develop in, uh, in some, you know, in my case, mostly in Latin America and Africa, what we can see is that we really don't need alternatives. What we need is an alternative thinking of alternatives. Amen. Alternatives are there, but we don't value them. We don't see them. And I really am always reminded of the reaction of the most of the Western critical tradi traditional theoreticians when we start the world social form. In a sense, the world social form didn't fit these ideas that we had developed before, and therefore they were really stigmatized. So in a sense, if we start with these ideas, then what is the alternative? The alternative is what I call the epistemologies of the South. And the epistemologies of the South is uh, a quest for new knowledges and new forms of production of the knowledge based on the experiences of the classes, the social groups that have suffered the injustices, discriminations, and oppressions of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. There are forms of knowledge that start from those spaces, and they are born in struggle, and they have to be kept there. And when we look at those, and these epistemologies of the South, as you can imagine, has nothing to do with a colleague of ours from Australia, Cornell, who wrote a recent book on Southern theory, which is very equivocal, because uh, Southern theory for us, for us are the theories produced by Southern theoreticians. Well, people that live in the geographical South, well, it doesn't make any sense to consider Fernando Henrique Cardoso as a theoretician of the South, in my sense. The South here is a metaphor for the unjust suffering by capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. It's not a geographical concept, even though most of the people may live in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But there is also a South in the North, as we, we even coined that many years ago, the, third, the, interior, the interior Third World, we know that. There is a south within the north, and there is a north within the south in this concept. Is the unjust suffering by colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy that leads, in fact, to this impulse of this global south. So the epistemologies, this, uh, epistemologies of south are based on two very broad ideas. I'm not going to be able to develop them uh, today. One of them, at least, I would like to, in the time that I still have, to give you a few glimpses of this one. The first, there are two very key concepts. One is ecology of knowledge, and the other is intercultural translation. What is ecology of knowledge? Well, the ecology of knowledge is the idea that all knowledges are incomplete. And therefore, there is no ignorance in general, no knowledge in general. We always know against a certain type of, type of ignorance, and you conquer a certain type of ignorance, but it's no knowledge in general, or no ignorance in general. It may turn out that what we learn for a given type of knowledge may be producing ignorance about another type of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I always quote, mention this problem, some of you have heard that, the story of my student, uh, an indigenous student law school uh, in Colombia when I was doing my work there and uh, she arrived at my office uh, crying. And the reason why she was crying because she was taking class in the law school the first year on contracts and property law and of course the, the professor was telling her and according to the civil code that land can is individually titled and of course can be sold, it can be bought and so on. And she raised her hand and said, but professor, in my community, this is not so, because the land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. And nobody can buy or sell land. And the professor shut her up, saying, you know, I'm teaching the civil code. I don't care about other concepts. And she arrived at my office precisely with this idea. So she was learning about the civil code, the modern rule of law, and by the same process, she was unlearning through the professor teaching about her own knowledge of property, communal property, according to the indigenous rules. 
So our institutions, our universities, are centers of learning and of unlearning. And we should very much concerned about how much and learn we produce by the, the process of learning and the teaching our students. And we should be very much aware uh, of that. And therefore, there is no hierarchy, abstract hierarchy among knowledges. There are contextual hierarchies among knowledge. If I want to go to the moon, I need scientific knowledge. If I want to defend biodiversity, I need indigenous knowledge. So the hierarchies among knowledge cannot be epistemological, a priori, as we have now. They are a posteriori hierarchies. There is to say, I'm calling for those that are more familiar, great influence, and my thought is John Dewey. It's a pragmatic view. We have to start from the consequences from the purposes of our knowledge, and therefore recognize which are the purpose that we want to pursue. With. And sometimes you can see that this conception in no way implies throwing into the dustbin of history and scientific knowledge. On the contrary, scientific knowledge is, per is precious for certain purposes, but not for all purposes. We have to include scientific knowledge in a broader landscape of knowledges. And therefore, have a counter hegemonic use of scientific knowledge. We have to not accept the foundational concepts of science on their face value. We have to use an hermeneutics of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis those concepts. We have to look into suppressed traditions within epistemologies. And here, we have a tower disposed of such a wealth of suppressed traditions now recognized through the epistemologies, the feminist epistemologies, the most remar remarkable advances in epistemology within the Western tradition. But we have also the indigenous philosophies these days, the African sagacity or the oral tradition that are bringing in other concepts of reality. Of, of, of identifications of nature, other different concepts of nature, very different from ours. Modes of knowledge for whom the, the distinction between culture and nature doesn't make any sense because we are not a part of nature. We are part of nature. Mother Earth is the concept of Pachama, of indigenous people. But the concept of Ubuntu is very close. The concept of Swadesh in Ghana is very much closer to this. So you have all kinds of different knowledges that we have to resort, so we have been wasting the experiences of these knowledges because they don't fit the Cartesian models of modern science. And if we do that, then it's a wealth of experience that comes out. And we don't have to be afraid of that because there is no romantic idea or romanticize now the non-scientific knowledge. It doesn't make any sense. They are useful for certain purposes, but for all purposes. And sometimes, the incompatibility between them and science is a, re a result of bad science. I, in one of the papers, if you read it, I tell the story of the, 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 the rice fields and the irrigation system in the rice fields of Bali in the 60s, when the Green Revolution came to Bali. And uh, probably in the, in, the, in the paper, I mentioned that these rice fields were, the irrigation system was managed by the priests of a goddess, a, very, a temple, the Hindu Buddhist temple, the goddess of Davidanu, the goddess of the lake. And for ages, the rice fields were irrigated according to those uh, laws, uh, those principles, ancestral principles by the priests. When the Green Revolution came, of course, they were put aside and they replaced that by scientific irrigation system, as they happen everywhere. And of course, what happened after that was the, the, the crops, the hills, declined by 50%. And the second year in a row, 50% declined. Then the Indonesian uh, government, uh, some years later, decided to abandon the scientific irrigation and call the priests back. And the irrigation system, according to the priests, went on from then on. Well, what happened was that 30 years later, two young kids, well, young scholars of the MIT, computer modeling specialists, analyzed the sequences of irrigation in the Bali, in the rice fields, 
and came to the conclusion they were the most precise that one could imagine. No other form of sequence would be most adequate to that reality other than the ones that were uh, developed by the priests. That is to say, there was no incompatibility between the, the science and the ancestral knowledge. The incompatibility was created by bad science because computer modeling revealed they were the most efficient sequences. And efficiency was what the Green Revolution was looking for. So why destroying the ancestral types of irrigation system? Because, as I say, of bad science. So if you look at this, you can see that uh, it is just a question of humility in the sense that there are limits of the reality that we can learn through a, kind, a certain type of knowledge. And these limits are there, and of course we should acknowledge them. But then we should acknowledge the other possibilities of other knowledge. A great uh, Ghanian philosopher, Vasi Viredu, has a beautiful text in which he said, look, in my his original native language, Akan, uh, a Ghanian uh, uh, dialect or national language, says, I cannot translate into Akan a very basic principle of Western philosophy, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Because I cannot translate that. Think does not exist in my language, because thinking, the, the closest is measuring something. The I, I cannot, because I does not exist in my language, because I'm here and I'm there, I'm with or without. But there is not the concept of I am. So I cannot translate that into my language. And he asks, is that an inferiority of my Akan language? He says, yes, it is true. I'd like to express in my own language a, such a basic principle, as cogito ergo sum. But then he goes on saying, but what can I say in Akan that you cannot understand in English or French or Spanish? And he goes on, for instance, to, with concepts from Akan which allow for the totality to be present in all the parts and not have any kind of harmony between the parts and the totality. The, cos the cosmological unity of the, the self and the community. The holistic forms of conception that for us are so difficult to develop. So you can see that what, uh, what he's doing here is what I call diatopical hermeneutics. That is to say, you interpret with one foot in one culture and another foot in another culture. And many of us have to be, in the future, intercultural translators. That is to say, we have to see the possibilities of translating from one reality into another reality, from one type of knowledge into another type of knowledge, knowing, of course, that there are many things that are incommensurable. In fact, after the five centuries of colonialism, many things are not pronounceable anymore. Many peoples lost their language. Many people lost the ways of affirming their aspirations. So you have tried to retrieve all these uh, experiences, not an easy task. But in fact, the work that we have been trying to conduct, we are trying to develop certain strategies through which we can put together different conceptions through intercultural translation. I've been doing that with human rights. I'm doing that now with citizenship. And will be the topic of my tomorrow's uh, talk. I'll talk a bit more on intercultural translation. And I'll be discussing the conceptions that came out of this knowledge. How are we going to reconstruct theories of citizenship based on this epistemological analysis and critique that I'm making and the proposal that I'm making. What kind of human rights? What kind of other concepts that we can develop out of this? And why the, as, is this important today? I think it is important because if we don't really expand the conversation of humankind, as John Dewey said, the alternative is war. And I think that we are closer and closer to war than we think. We are still feeling very protected, but less and less protected. 
So there is no other way other than expanding the conversation of humankind. And no illusion, we cannot expand the conversation of humankind in our own terms. That is in Western terms. We have to learn how to have a discussion in which our terms are not the premises of the argumentation, but are arguments. That is to say, we have to argue for them. We cannot take for granted that they are accepted by everyone. And if you do this hermeneutic of suspicions, you look at concepts like tomorrow a little bit on the concept of autonomy, of the individual, of nature, basic concepts. If you subject to them the landscape that comes out, is a richer landscape. And we should not be afraid of this richness. We should not, we should not be afraid of getting lost in translation. Because I think that we are, what we've been is we have been really lost in the world. The West is more and more. The problem is that the ideas, the power of us of our ideas is being replaced by the ideas of power. Military power. And we are economizing a lot of conversation. And we are repressing and suppressing that conversation. So I end here and we'll continue tomorrow. Masha. Um, you talked about incompatibility born of bad science. And I think we see that taking place frequently, particularly when it comes to economics. Um, you know, trying to impose Western economic models of democratization and, um, along with capitalism in a lot of countries. Um, specifically in Africa, you know, during the decolonization period. And um, what role do you think that we have in, I mean, essentially those things were done to reduce human suffering. So what role do we have in, I, I know it ties into sort of expanding the conversation of kind, but like specifically, what does this look like? Like as individuals, what, what do you see people doing to address these situations without, you know, sort of settling with those colonial attitudes? Well, it, it all depends on the we. Who are the we? We, individual scholars, we members of countries, of uh, uh, countries that used to be rich countries and now are countries of rich people. Um, what, what are you we? What, what kind of knowledge can we mobilize here? I think that uh, we have to address that issue uh, in the sense that we have taken for granted uh, and um, you can see that, you gave the example of Africa. Africa is probably the best example in which we have imposed uh, Western notions, at particularly the economic level, with uh, very destructive effects. And because we have not been able to develop one part of my work that I didn't develop here, that there are different types, types of contemporary aid. <coughs> that is to say, a peasant in Africa is my contemporary, contemporary, but is contemporary in a different way. For us, following a, a linear time conception of history, the peasant in Africa is a residue, is a backward, is something that is ending. And we, if we look at the rapid rural appraisals, appraisals by the World Bank, in which they go through Africa and other countries, and in 15 days, they account for the situation of the agriculture in those countries, it's very clear the linear time behind that is this monoculture of the linear time. And therefore, it's very clear to see that if the, the peasant meets the CEO of the World Bank, of the executive, or whatever, it is a sim simultaneous encounter, but it's not an encounter among contemporary people. So the first thing for us is to see that the others are our contemporary. So we have to understand different concepts of contemporaneity and not uh, having just one way, which is our way. Because that's the problem of our concept. So the we is that you have to question some of the basic concepts, the concept of development. Why was development as a concept created to transform 90% of the world into an underdeveloped world? That was the purpose. From one day to the next, most of the people in the world lived in underdeveloped countries. And the underdeveloped countries were not just their economies, their institutions, their ways of life, their religions, 
their cultures were underdeveloped. And therefore, they were open, as a kind of a terra nullius, to all the foreign aid, development aid, foreign assistance, and so on and so forth. So it is out of this critique that you have to engage yourself in your own work. I mean, of course, it is your responsibility to do your problem. <laughs> that is to say, not the people have a self-determination problem, we have a self-determination problem ourselves. And therefore, we have to see, uh, according to our trajectories, which, which are our options. I can tell you my option, but uh, you know, it doesn't work for you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it could work for, for you. I mean, for the, the past, well, for many, many, many years, but you know, for the past uh, uh, 10 years, 15 years, I've been working very, very closely with indigenous peoples in, in Latin America, particularly in Ecuador and Bolivia, and we started, in fact, in Colombia. And what I'm, most of my theoretical work is, uh, is working with them, in a sense, and I'm sure, and of course I'm aware of the expropriation that I may also take, because I'm here, they cannot be here with me. They wouldn't get a visa to get into the United States today, because most of them are terrorists. No, no, they are. I mean, there are 200 people to Mapuches in Chile, and sadly enough, to 300 in Ecuador, indigenous leaders indicted as terrorists by their countries. They are not indicted by the United States. They are indicted by their own countries. What they have done? Blocking roads. Not to allow for the multinationals to get into their territories. And all these laws now, which used to be obstruction of traffic and so on, are really anti-terrorist laws. And they have dire consequences for the people. So, it is out of this experience that I, I have come, of course I can tell you that my first experience that uh, I came to know that there was an ecology of knowledge was taught to me in my PhD dissertation as I did my PhD for Yale, that I lived in a couple of months in a favela in Rio de Janeiro. I did what, you know, participant observation, that's what I did. And I could see that all these marginal, of very dangerous people, I got most of the wisdom about the world I could have, was in conversation with these people, elite people. But we could develop really conversations about the meaning of the world, the meaning of the future and the past, different conceptions that alert me to the idea that there are alternatives and tomorrow in the concepts of citizenship we'll see how I developed some of these alternative concepts. They are really borne out just not on empirical research, is on solidarity work. Mm -hmm. Because participant observation is one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, uh, naive forms of expropriation. Because you go so closely inside that you are, you know, a good robber much more. You know. And I did that, so, and I did that. So today what you have to do is really to work, to see how your work can further help the struggles of them. So I worked very closely in the preparation of the constitutional processes in Bolivia and Ecuador. <coughs> and I went there and I'm fighting there now because we have a, a very strong struggle in Bolivia going on tonight. Yeah, a struggle in which I'm involved is the Tipnis, I don't know if you know that, is a national park. And the government, a progressive Marxist government, indigenous government, wants to build a highway through the park. And the indigenous people don't allow that. Because they say that they are their sacred territory. And the highway would destroy their relationship with the nature. So we're not talking about you know, reactionary oligarchies. We are talking about the government of one of the most remarkable Marxists in Latin America, Álvaro García Linera, good friend of mine, vice president of the government. Different conceptions. Is it possible to have a discussion and a conversation? Because if we don't have a conversation, we have war, as they have. They really tried to stop the march, but they didn't succeed in stopping the march, because the Bolivians are very much used to marching, as Evo Morales used to do. So they arrived in, in La Paz, and the road is suspended. More, there is a law that says that deepness is intangible. They said no. Bro, can go to the deepest part. 
So a democratic event, which is not in our scripts of democracy, because this is neither revolution nor reformism. It's something else. Because it cuts across different universes of knowledge. You have the indigenous knowledge on one side and the modern nationalist knowledge on the other side. Both of them are honorable. Both of them are allies. That's why it is so difficult to take sides. But, but we have to find a way. Because if we don't find a way, we know the result. The progressive forces get divided and the right, the oligarchies, come back. Uh, they may be come, coming back in Bolivia, they may come back in Venezuela, they may come back in Ecuador. So these are the struggles in Latin America. What you can see in India these days, the same types of struggles are much less visible to us, but they are being conducted according to different, it's, not, it's, it's, it's different conceptions of development, except that for some is not development. It's something else, it's self-determination. The struggles against land grabbing. You have to, you have to, we have to understand that's why it is so difficult to theorize, because it's a, it's a communist government, West Bengal government, that decides against uh, untouchables and against the Adivis, the tribal people, to sell huge tracts of land for development. And they rebel against that. We are not talking about the right and the, the left in a very uh, clear sense. Because on, uh, you know, on, one could even say that the, the Adivasis are the rightest ones, because they, that's what the, our communist friends say, because they are obstacles to development. Different conceptions. And these conceptions are based now on different cultural universities. So I think that our task at this stage, uh, in our universities, I mean, where we are here, is to acknowledge this diversity and to respect it, and to try to know it. And then it is our responsibility to join the struggles that we don't, we think that we should join. But always based in, in, on this idea that nothing comes new out of theory without a relationship with innovative practices. Rudolph, you had to come Yeah, <clears throat> following on, on that last comment, I was wondering, uh, if these changes in the notion of regulation and emancipation have to do with the new realities in Latin America because it was easier to understand the bad neoliberal governments against the good social movements with this framework, presentation and emancipation. And I was wondering what, what was your idea about um, these new governments that take many of the ideas of social movement and sometimes even the leaders like Evo Morales or, or Lula. Uh, how this, uh, if this change in notion is related to this, uh, that you said before that the emancipation and regulation dichotomy uh, uh, that you were doing a critique of that. And the second question related to that is if besides the the struggles for nation, natural resources, mm -hmm. you see also uh, class struggles as part of the contradictions uh, in these governments, like uh, mm -hmm. in Brazil, in Bolivia, yeah. and so Definitely. No, that's very, two, two very good questions. The first one is uh, it's a good example of what I'm saying is that the, the, the distinction between regulation and emancipation, which in fact was developed based on the experience of metropolitan societies, and, uh, and therefore didn't cover all the realities of colonial societies, are very much there. The conceptions, even, and, and I, I'm saying that I'm trying to get these hard cases because they are progressive forces. We cannot say that Evo Morales is a rightist, or, or you can't say that, right? Uh, so why is that I see the, this division, this abyssal division between the, regulation emancipation on one side and appropriation violence on the other side is the ways in which some of these indigenous struggles are dealt with. For instance, you hear things, and, and it's, I can't go into the complexities of the argument in the Bolivian case because uh, uh, the indigenous identity of Evo Morales is being questioned today by the indigenous movements. But this is a very complex question of the 
we can debate that like if you want, but it, it's, it's a, a different issue. But what is clear in the arguments of the government is that the indigenous people are being easily manipulated by the U.S. imperialism. That is to say, indigenous peoples are minors, as they used to be, according to this model of thinking. Therefore, they are easily manipulated. I'm not saying that they are not attempts at that. Of course, the US ID today in the continent is the new form of imperialism in Latin America, is local development. We go to the remotest areas in Latin America and you see a project by the US ID. A group of theater, a group of culture. It's not, they are not funding military now coups, because military coups are out for the, the moment, right? They are these cultural projects. And that's where you see many of the indigenous leaders against governments have been project leaders. So you, you see that. But am I going to reduce the indigenous struggles to the US imperialism in Latin America? I can't do that. But this, ar this argument is easily made because the idea that the indigenous are children so therefore, we cannot apply the same rules are still there. That is to say, the Abyssal line is still very much in the conceptions that run through these conflicts, even when they are, as I say, progressive forces altogether. And the same thing happens with the natural resources. Because here you can see uh, that we have two conceptions very clearly, two conceptions not just of development, it's conceptions of nature. Because our concept of nature is our Western concept as a kind of an inert reality that is inexhaustible, infinite, but is res extensive according to Descartes, is, is, is really a very peculiar form. Because it only exists in this corner of the world. Because for most people in the world, nature is Mother Earth, is a, is a living system with cycles we are the restoration cycles with needs and we are part of that mother so the natural resources then we have created this idea which is many people have created that indigenous people are against the the exploitation and fluoridation of natural resources they are not but they would like to change the terms and they are they would like to be consulted they are not being consulted they are not being consulted by china they are not being consulted by by rafael correa they are not being consulted by by Ed Morales. So this consultation, which after all is international law, is Convention 169 of the ILO, is not being respected. So we have to see, and that's of course you can say, well, but these are two absolutely incompatible, incommensurable conceptions of nature. They are. But it is possible to have an intercultural translation. It is. If you start a conversation based on these premises, if I'm going to say that, you know, your concept of Mother Earth is bullshit, I mean, Mother Earth, what is that? A river is a river. A man and a woman is a man and a woman. How can a river be sacred? See, if we start from this, no conversation is possible. But if we accept there are people for whom rivers are sacred, certain rivers, not all rivers, of course, certain rivers are sacred, now you can start a conversation and we can probably exploit those resources in a way that does not hurt the spirit of the land. And I'm giving you, as a giving this I'm an example from Malaysia, it's not a, a, is a, is a, a, an example of the orange angry people in, in Malaysia. So it's a different idea, but you know, they are different in which you can see these different forms of negotiation that can develop. But I can see that very much there. Because we don't have the DNA of the left in uh, in Latin America is uh, desiratism, developmentalism, now nationalist, and there is no alternative. And I understand the problem, of course, because we need a transitional period, a very serious transitional period. Because when the budget of Ecuador is 60 percent comes from extraction, I cannot stop extraction tomorrow. What we have to see is the, whether we are entering a transitional period in which we are really changing the economic specialization of the country and the forms in which you can exploit these uh, natural resources. That's the thing. Um, we, we've, just so everyone, we've had many conversations around these kinds of 
issues, but th there's one particular formulation that I would just like to get clarity. So, and it has to do with the um, critique of the notion of certain kinds of knowledge as universal. And there's two kinds of criticisms one could make. One is a false sense that certain kinds of knowledge are comprehensive. That is, they are, they cover everything. And the other is that they're not universal. So I consider, for example, the claim that profit-maximizing capitalist corporations are environmentally destructive everywhere, that that's true when they go to Ecuador, this is when they go to northern Wisconsin, and that that's universally true. It's not just true in the north, it's true when those corporations act that way in the south. And that that knowledge of it is something which is important to communicate to indigenous people so that they don't misdescribe what is being, what the causal mechanisms of that destruction are. Mm -hmm. Namely, it's the profit maximizing uh, externalization of costs as much as you can onto the environment rather than internalizing that into the, you know, the, the full value of the relationship of that process to the world. Mm -hmm. I think that's universal. That is, it's a, it is an established kind of knowledge that should be accepted by everybody. And if they deny that it's true, they're wrong. They're not just have a different perspective, they're incorrect. Mm -hmm. But I don't think knowledge generated through that kind of reasoning is comprehensive. Because I don't think it solves every problem, that it identifies every source of conflict, every need and perspective that has to be included in the full understanding of everything. Mm -hmm. But your, So your criticism against universalism doesn't seem to me right, because it somehow says, you know, it seems inconsistent to say knowledge isn't universal and to say we shouldn't throw out scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think it is universal, just not comprehensive. And maybe wrong, right. you know, maybe bad science, bad science is bad science, you know, so. Um, well, at the trivial level, it's like the positivist struggle. At the trivial level, you can say there are some universal things. I mean, if I cross the street and if I run out by an auto, I cannot have a constructionist view of, of truth because, in fact, uh, well, I, mean, I, I have an accident. I'm talking about social so, But in this case, in this case, if you go beyond the trivial, I mean, the, the, the problem is, is, Eric, is this. What is the opposite of profit maximizing? What are, can we imagine entities that are not profit, profit maximizing sure. in your theory? Sure. And how do you formulate that? Right. Because the way in which an indigenous person can receive your information depends on the context in, within which he locates your piece of knowledge. Because no piece of knowledge exists separate. So our idea that you have a statement like this one, the multinationals always do this. And this piece of knowledge exists by itself and is active by itself and not in a context. It's very much Western. The problem is that you have to understand when you say it is, first of all, how it is received, how people understand profit maximizing to begin with. Is profit maximizing, if you are saying this to some other people in other cultures, profit maximizing may be understood as happiness maximizing. Right, so you'd have to explain that that's not what you mean by it. But, you not, but once you so, try to, to explain that, you are not being the, universal. You no, are no, dialoguing with other forms of knowledge. I'm not saying the words are universal, but the word profit is universal. I'm saying the mechanisms by which a capitalist firm decides what to do, how much to destroy, and how to do it, that those mechanisms apply wherever those firms operate. Of course we'll need to translate the words properly, so if the word profit means happiness in some places, then you have to explain, no, no, that's not what we mean. But, I, but, the, but the identification of the knowledge involved in such a proposition, I don't think it's trivial to say that capitalism is environmentally destructive inherently because of its structure of mechanisms. But, but you see, but, but Eric, look at that. Capital is environmental destructive because you have a concept of environment, right? And we only have a, a concept of environment because, because our economic system destroys the environment. We don't have the concept of environment 
in the peasant Africa. We don't have the concept of environment. But we'll still, destroy the, we'll still destroy their so, environment regardless of whether they have the concept. I know, but by imposing your concept, you imp are imposing your political <laughs> multinationals. I'm not imposing my concept. I'm simply saying that the temperature in the air is going to rise and they're going to have droughts. And they know what a drought is. I mean, they have droughts and they know what it means. But why do you need the concept? Why is it so important for you to be universal? You're not contextual. I'm not. I'm not saying universal. You may be first by being contextual. I'm saying both. I'm saying that the, the that there are propositions which hold everywhere, and that is capitalism is going to do this damage wherever it goes. And this is only important for you because if something is is valid everywhere, is better than something no. that is not valid everywhere. No, no, no. It's because Basically. it would be a mistake. It would be a. It would be incorrect for me to say this isn't valid everywhere, and I mean it would be a false statement to say that. Only some places does capitalism cause human suffering. Mm -hmm. That would be an incorrect statement. Mm -hmm. And capitalists don't believe what I'm saying. Most Americans don't believe what I'm saying. It's not like what I say is a universal truth that's accepted here. Mm -hmm. It may be Eurocentric, but it sure as hell isn't believed by. But why is it universal if most people don't believe in it? Because they're wrong. <laughs> Most so you have a concept of truth that tells you who is right and who is true, and that's your No, problem. I have a concept of truth which makes it possible to say some people are mistaken. That is, some people hold false views, and I, uh, including me. I'm sure that many things that I believe are not correct. I don't have an absolutist view. I don't have but a view that says, I know what a final view is. But that is an absolute No, it's view. not. I just say that I can compare beliefs. I can't say that my beliefs are absolutely true. There's no Archimedean point to create, to establish absolute truth. But I can compare two views. One is capitalism is wonderful for the environment and it only helps nature and helps people thrive. And another view which says it's damaging to your health. And I can show through argument and evidence that my claims about capitalism, which are the same as your claims as about capitalism. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need your concept of universal. I mean, I, you I, I, well, uh, uh, I you, Wouldn't someone come at you then and say, well, there are different capitalisms? Yes, and so my, my claim was the very first approximation. I mean, we're, you know, I agree. There are variations in capitalism, and some are worse than others. And but not variations in capitalism. Again, that's an object, object, an object. And adjective work that you're qualifying it. There are different capitalisms. Well, then why use the word? If we're going to use the same word, capitalism, that means there's something that are, they have in common by virtue of which we're justified in using the same term. So they are variations, therefore. I mean, we have to avoid just playing word games where, you know, I define capitalism as Christmas and you define capitalism as an economic system. You know, words can be used in all sorts of ways. We're talking about theoretical concepts. Yeah, Sarah. Maybe just as a counterexample, and I mean, for the most part, I agree with this, how capitalism destroys the environment, but for example, in some game parks, I mean, there's some areas in, especially parts of Africa, where people have really wanted to create game parks in order to keep animals alive, sure. in order to maintain like um, the native biodiversity. Not that I necessarily agree with it or think that that's like the best option, but like the economic valuation of the environment is one technique by which people have tried to use capitalism to actually um, preserve the environment. Or to, it, it, and this is, it might just be some rhetoric, it might not work out, but that's, you know, if we're going to talk about contextual knowledge, I mean, I think in that particular context, even if people are persuaded falsely, to them maybe capitalism may not have the same destructive effect on the environment. And I know what you're saying is that they might, might just be wrong, but... Well, the, well, I, I, I mean, I was using an example that was meant to be simple, not... But the simplest example, Eric, is what, is humanity uh, a universal concept? Uh, probably not. Why not? I mean, it's too vague to be. And that is, you'd have to say uh -huh. what you mean by it. Why is whereas it? Cap whereas for capitalism, I can specify a set of necessary conditions for it to count as capitalism. So if by humanity, you want it to. so if, if all you mean is that is there a species that we call human beings? Yes, Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's if that's what you are asking, is there such a species? And I would look to biology, and I would, you know, view my what the evidence is, and I would 
Now my question is different, is that all along we have been, this, this is a simple question, probably this question of humanism, of the humanity, was one of the original universal concept of the humanists, was the concept of humanity. And it starts in the 14th century, and it's very important as a kind of, of an aggregating concept of your, your all humankind. But what we can say that all the formulations that they developed at the time were formulations that, for instance, left out women. But women didn't count as being a negation of the universality because they were not part of the system. So whenever we make a statement that is general, but on the other side of the line, there are other realities which are not relevant for our argument. Of course, we may make a kind of a general concept, but you are leaving out all these other populations in this case. And that's why the concept of humanity became, for me, for instance, I, if you ask me, I say, well, it's not. Humanity is an aspiration. Because when I look at the history of ideas, humanity in our Modern societies, capitalist societies, doesn't go without subhumanity. We always need some categories that are subhuman. They may, they may be women, they may be indigenous people, they may be whatever. Well, you don't so, have any subhuman categories. You don't. You don't. No, I'll, I'll talk tomorrow about that. But no, you. The you, of, do you actually think there are people who are subhuman? No. Okay, so you don't have any subhuman. But, but what I'm saying, why do I need that, that in order to be right that I'm universal? No, no, I'm just saying. That's the hubris of I'm Western not saying knowledge. In order to be, I'm not saying in order to be right you have to be universal. So I'm just saying there are some things which are universal. It's mm -hmm. not that everything no, is universal. Just the opposite. In order to be universal, I should be right. That's your argument. No, no, no. I'm saying there are some propositions I can make about the world that hold everywhere. Your world, the way you view no, it. No, it's not just a matter of perspective. I think that some... Precisely. Well, including your things are not just a matter of perspective. It, I, I, I think they are. As I and I'm not offended as, by I that. I acknowledge as a universal truth that... People situated in specific concepts have access to knowledge that people out of those contexts don't have. I think that's always true. That is your claim, I think, is a universal claim, that indigenous people and people no. located in any context have access to forms of knowledge that are not but accessible it, outside Eric, of those But contexts. that's a bad formulation, because it's a, pers a perspective-less idea about perspectives. I think that's right. It's a universal claim about perspectives, as opposed to that it's only in some places and in some indigenous people that have specific knowledge. I'm prepared to say it's true in general, not just that it's true for the particular indigenous people who you've met, but it's true in general. And that that's important for people out of those contexts to fully recognize so that they listen and exchange and do the intercultural translation, which I agree is absolutely necessary for somebody who's out of the context to get access to the special kinds of knowledge you get only by being inside of a context. So I think that's a, I think, but I think that's a universal truth, not a particularistic one. It's not a partial truth. It doesn't apply to only some indigenous people. It applies to every situated knowledge. Even the idea of God is partial. How can you say that is? there are no partial truths? I mean, I, I don't understand. Well, fact I'm that ecumenical. They You're not. I'm ecumenical. I think some truths may be partial, some may not. I just don't no. have... To be ecumenical <laughs> is to allow for ecumenical perspectives, not to allow for a perspective-less perspective about them. There is this, that something is in general, that something is universal. And because of it is, is a, one of the things that is basic of our modern knowledge is what I call the dominant scale. Mm -hmm. For us, we have two very dominant scales, the global and the universal. Whatever is the opposite of these things are diminished realities. Well, I would, but the local that. versus the global. I, I would not have that. That is, I never said that the local is less valid, less valuable, less crucial, less important, less foundational to our ability to transform the world and reduce human suffering. But then why do you need the concept of universal? Because if you have an equivalent, are, the particular is no, an equivalent no, 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 to no, it. Because some things are universal, like the destructiveness of capitalism. I think that's, I think it is destructive, wherever, it, you know, as a system. And I, it is destructive, but I, <laughs> Patrick. No, I just want to, because it, it <laughs> seems like you guys are not going to come to an end. Yeah, we've been at this for 25 months. Well, but I want to ask Boa two questions based on what you've been saying. Get him to answer two questions. One is, are there any universal truths in your opinion? 
Mm -hmm. And two, do you agree with Eric's claim that profit maximizing capitalist corporations, wherever they go, will be destructive to the environment? Do you believe that holds true everywhere? I would have to analyze that. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that I need to, to be absolutely uh, unconditionally about that because the, the game uh, well, yeah, I think would, and I would maybe that. just the opposite. Maybe yeah, sure. just uh, capitalism is good for the environment under certain sure. circumstances. Right, but I would agree with that. That's not. So uh, why should I need that? Uh, again, I have to look into the context. And the first yeah. question, in fact, I don't agree, but uh, of course it is a bad answer to a bad question. Because the problem is with the question, if there are universal tools. Of course there are no universal tools. That is it's impossible. I cannot figure out something that will be a universal tool. That sounds like a claim to a universal tool. Well, that's, yeah, no, no. That's, that's, that's a different thing. No, no. That it's, logical it's a negative form no, okay. of defending the, uh, the possibilities of a conversation. Why is that? Because among us, we are not bad, we are serious. I mean, we, we always like these debates, this, this, this is our uh, game, uh, video games uh, version. But uh, <laughs> with, a lot. With, uh, with, with, among us, it's not a problem. But if we are in real struggles, not in this environment, and with people that they don't have the same learning that we have, they don't have the same sex, they don't have the same culture, they don't have the same uh, uh, forms of consumption in your life, and so on. And if you want to entertain a conversation, the conversation about the universals is the worst possible way of starting a conversation, in my experience. Because by saying something universal, you are putting yourself in an imperial position. And therefore, you are denying other possibilities that, from your point of view, are going to be, look like stupid. And they, in fact, they may be, in fact, for you. They're not for them. So it's a bad start. I, I wouldn't go there. I no, I, I think that, you know, you know, in one of my papers, I talk about uh, 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 universal, uh, universalism from bottom up. That is to say, universalism would be a good point of arrival. But it's never a good start. Yeah, well, that I would, that I don't disagree. With. We agree on that. Okay, good. we agree on that. Good, that is, good. That, that, that. And I think we also have to agree that um, it's 20 till, and we need to stop for today. But as you can see, I will try to discipline my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh,